morning, everyone. It is really an honor for me, and I am very serious when I say it's an honor for me and for us uh, to introduce a wonderful speaker. When I uh, taught a course on Palestinian contextual theology, the books of both of our presenters today were at the list of the class, and there are a lot of things we can learn from them. And the, gladly, their, some of their books are at the display behind. I want to introduce Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib. Dr. Rahib has been the pastor of the Evangelical Christmas Lutheran Church since 1988. He taught at Bethlehem Bible College, that was before I came, that's too sad, between 1988 and 1993, and served as the managing editor of al Liqa journal for religious and heritage studies in the Holy Land in 1992 until 1996. He has founded and led a number of institutions serving the social needs of Palestinians living in the Bethlehem area, including the International Center of Bethlehem, Dar al-Kalima, the Dar al-Kalima Model School, and the Diyar Consortium. His book, Bethlehem Besieged, Stories of Home in Times of Trouble was published in 2004, among many other writings and books that he has published. He was presented with the Aachen Peace Award in 2008. It is really a privilege to welcome Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib. Please welcome him with us. Good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hanna, for this introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. Uh, and um, for me, it's really great to see the Bible College uh, putting this uh, great conference uh, together. Uh, not only, actually, I taught at the Bible College a long time ago, but actually I, I studied there one year before I went to Germany. So there is like a, a long history uh, of interaction with the Bible College. And it's also great to see so many uh, friends here. Um, and um, there is like a kind of uh, a bit... Uh, I wanted actually... Reverend Naim to speak before me because, uh, you know, I feel he's one of my teachers and now I have to speak before him. But uh, um, uh, since he will talk about Sabil and I will talk a bit more about actually uh, a theology in the Palestinian context. And what I'm going to present to you today is actually maybe it's a new... I think you have to get used to it because it's a bit maybe unusual, maybe it's a new way of thinking. Uh, it might push the envelope for you a bit. Uh, I'm glad that there are no tomatoes uh, on, the, on the table so that no one will throw me with them. But, uh, 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 but this is really the outcome of, uh, of my theological work in the last five years especially. Uh, uh, trying really to read the Bible with Palestinian Christian eyes. And uh, I think the difference maybe between this approach and many other approaches, even my previous approaches, is that I think that until recently, we all, even as Palestinian theologians, we were dancing on the rhythm of European theology of the 19th century. Trying to react here, to react there, to change here, to change, but the assumptions, the system of thinking was still 19th century Europe. Here I feel maybe for the first time we start really again with the context. So I'm saying this just to warn you a bit uh, and hopefully you can... Um, and let me start maybe with uh, three assumptions which are important for you to understand uh, the whole concept I'm going to, to present today. Uh, the first is uh, the Bible 
could not have been written anywhere else but in Palestine. This is for me an assumption. It could not have been written in Egypt, it, can have, it could not have been written in Persia, it could not have been written in Rome, although maybe some small parts, but it is connected to this land. So this is the first assumption. And the second assumption is that the Palestinian people and part of the Jewish people are the continuation of the peoples of the land. It's not Israel, according to what I'm going to present to you. You will see why. Actually, Israel presents Rome of the Bible, not the people of the land. And this is not only uh, because I'm a Palestinian. I'm sure if we were to do a DNA test between David, who was a Bethlehemite, and Jesus, born in Bethlehem, and Mitri, born just across the street from where Jesus was born, I'm sure the DNA will show there a trace, while if you put King David, Jesus, and Netanyahu, you will get nothing, because Netanyahu comes from a, 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 an East European tribe who converted to Judaism in the Middle Ages. I said I will be pushing a bit the envelope, but so far you are surviving. I'm, I'm glad for that. Uh, and, you know, being born just across the street from where Jesus was born, I always uh, love to say, you know, most probably, most probably, one of my grand, 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 grandmas used to babysit for Jesus. <laughs> so, so that's the second assumption that actually, if we want to understand what the people mentioned in the Bible were dealing with, we have to listen to the Palestinian voice. Not because of the DNA, but because of this experience that I will talk to uh, about uh, uh, shortly. And in that sense, I think, and sometimes I think, especially evangelicals, they don't take that seriously. Actually, the Palestinian Christians are mainly, are the only one in the world that when they speak about their forefathers, they mean their actual forefathers, but also the forefathers of the faith. For us, they are the same. Think about it. And uh, the third uh, assumptions uh, I would like uh, to make uh, here is that I will not talk about the daily life, the facts on the ground as in the, as in the title, but I will try to talk about the bigger picture. So for me, if you would really understand the bigger picture, this is how I try to understand the bigger picture. Uh, if we can please put just uh, the first slide. So I have seven points so that you can follow me. These are the seven pillars, uh, the seven pillars for a theology, a Christian theology in the Palestinian context. We start, the first point, the land. What is so special about this land? If you look at it, it's, it's there in the middle. Actually, what is special in this land, if you look at the geopolitical picture, uh, and by the way, you will see lots of uh, corresponding with, with Gary's uh, Birch, uh, actually, lecture. Uh, I think there is a very interesting dialogue will be going on, but it's a totally different uh, 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 starting point and maybe ending point, but we have to talk about it later. So, what is really special about this land? We think that this land, let's call it Israel-Palestine, we think that this land is in the center of the universe, right? 
This is why in Jerusalem, there is this center of the world. In ancient maps, Jerusalem is always in the center. But actually, this is nothing but a myth. Geopolitically speaking, this land is nothing but a land on the periphery. Always. This land is always surrounded by five regional powers. They change a bit, but really not much for the last at least, you know, 3,000 years. You have Persia, today's Iran. If you, if you think you can get rid of Iran, this is, will continue to be a regional power. They are there. Then you have either Babylonia or Assyria, one of them. You cannot have a strong Iraq and a strong Syria at the same time. Usually one is strong, one is weak. But they are the second superpower. The third superpower are here called the Phrygians, that are Turkey. Turkey is a major superpower in this region. We cannot change, change that. There are 80 million people. It's like the, the Persian. And then you have Europe, Greece, Rome. These will continue to be a major power surrounding uh, Palestine. And then you have Egypt in the south. This is the geopolitical picture of the region. And in the middle, but really not in the center, but at the periphery, you, ha you will have Israel-Palestine. If you look carefully, you will see that even at that time the land was a bit divided. So what is special about this geopolitical setting of Israel-Palestine? Actually, every time the regional superpowers wanted to have fun, they call it war, they wouldn't fight their wars on their territory, but they come to this country to have all of their wars. And so it is not by chance that Armageddon is located here, because this country actually is nothing but a battlefield for regional superpowers up to this moment. It will not change, by the way. If you think we can change it, I, I am afraid we cannot change it. And, and this is why, actually, if you look carefully, you will see this is a land uh, on, the, on the periphery. And all regional powers, they try to have influence in our country. Now, this is a land on the periphery. That's the first point. Now, the second point is, so what does that mean for the peoples of the land? You know, it's not fun to live on a battlefield. For those of you who were at, at, at our center on Monday for the, for the dance theater, I'm not sure if, you, if all of you got really what the, what the dance was all about, but it was showing Palestinians trying to build up their normal life, getting in love, getting married, dancing, going after their business, and every time their normal life is interrupted by something. It was shooting, this and that. And I'm really not sure if you can put yourself in the shoes of a Palestinian. You know, you try to build up, like our, our Prime Minister yesterday, yesterday said, you try to build up your country, you try to build institutions, you try to, pre to create home, and then the next war starts, and you have nothing to do with the war. It's all of these big guys around you that are playing, and suddenly you find yourself on that battlefield, and you are the ball the regional powers are playing with. Can you feel all of these hits that the peoples of this land are getting over and over and over again? It's very tough to live on this battlefield under the influence 
of all of these superpowers that actually they determine your life. You are basically nothing compared with all of these superpowers. So that is the, re the reality of the peoples of the land. Again, today they aren't Israel. This experience I'm talking about, it's only the Palestinian they understand it. Because Israel represents Rome. The third point, God. Where is God in all of this? You know, God is very visible in Egypt. You go there, you see the pyramids, he is strong, visible. You see him. You go to Iran, God is visible. You go to Rome, God is visible. You go to Athens, God is visible. He's strong, he's there. But God in this country is totally hidden. You do not see him. He didn't leave even any trace. Even his temple was destroyed. His people pushed into exile. Totally invisible. Totally weak. So, what is the most important question? If you live as people in this land, the most important question, and you hear it every day coming out from the mouth of Palestinian people, God, where are you? You see these walls being erected around the little town of Bethlehem. You are doing nothing. God, where are you? You see all of these settlements taking our land. What are you doing about it? Silence. You see our people are crushed under this military occupation and you do nothing. You don't even move a finger. Where are you? And actually, the entire Bible from chapter 1 of Genesis to Revelation 22 is just dealing with this question, where are you? Not where is God, but God, where are you? It's this struggle with God, where are you? Why are you so invisible? Why are you so weak? Why don't you do something about it? In that sense, the topic for this conference is to the point, Christ on the checkpoint. Where is God? And you know the biggest revelation of the Bible? What was it? The biggest revelation was God was in exile. God was there when the temple was destroyed. In the middle of the defeat, our forefathers were able to see God. He was there where no one would have expected him to be. He wasn't in Egypt, and he wasn't in Iran, and he wasn't in Italy, and he wasn't in Athens. He was there on the battlefield. And this is why it's exactly right that the life of Jesus ends where? On the cross. This is where God belongs. He is there in the ultimate defeat where people thought it's over. There was God. And actually, believe it or not, God was able to do it. He was able to defeat this geopolitical uh, uh, setting because, you know, I mean, Bethlehem without Jesus would be the most boring 
little town that no one really would know about. Jerusalem without God is nothing. I mean, go look at the archaeology. Without God, Jerusalem will be four homes, poor people, nothing. But because God revealed himself in this land, this is how he was able to transform the whole geopolitical setting. And this is actually why Jerusalem became in the center. You know, without God, we would be really living just on a battlefield. But because God came here, he transformed the battlefield into a holy land. It's a huge transformation. And I'm not talking about theory, I'm talking about how people feel. Who would live on a battlefield? The fourth point, the neighbor. If you live in this part of the world, and if it's really true that this land is on the periphery, then, and you are always under the influence of all of these superpowers, what happens is that your neighbor will become the enemy. Why? Because he become representing a superpower and you are representing another superpower and you start hating each other because you represent these superpowers. This is what's happening today with Fatah and Hamas. Hamas being under the influence of two of the superpowers in the north, Iran and Syria, Fatah being under the influence of Egypt in the south, Divided country. Your neighbor become the enemy. We have even families where they have two kids, one is Fatih, one is Hamas. They become enemies. And this is why the second important question in the entire Bible is, where is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Where is your brother? And actually, the entire Bible is trying to answer this question, and the, the answer is, your enemy is your neighbor. It's a new look at the geopolitics. He's not your enemy. Maybe he represents another superpower, but actually, he is your potential neighbor. And it's actually a new look at the whole situation. So I come to the fifth point. I'm running out of time. The, the third important question the Bible deals with, but this is the fifth point, but the third important question is, so, liberation. How do we liberate ourselves? If we are always living under occupation, and believe me, for the last 3,000 years, tell me when Palestine was not under occupation. I, I, I don't know any, actually, any era where Palestine was not under occupation. It was always occupied. So, what's the way to liberation? And in the Bible, there are five answers. Gary talked about three, actually, that evening. Uh, again, but I will show them from a Palestinian perspective. The first answer is, if we really want to be liberated, we have to abide the law, the Sharia. We connect the Pharisees to some groups in Israel today, but actually, the continuation of the Pharisees are the Islamic Brotherhood. This is their model. They want a country governed by Sharia. Only and only if we abide by God's law, we will be liberated. Good luck. Unfortunately, 
there are many evangelicals who are so naive they think they are calling for this Sharia. The second, it's obvious, they hit, we hit back. So we take revolt. And that is basically what jihad and maybe other groups are calling for. The third is, just to do it quickly, accommodation. We cannot beat them. We play the game with them. The fourth, subcontracting. This is what, the, what, what in the Bible the, the tax collector were doing. This is what many Palestinians, subcontractors for Israeli companies. And the fifth answer was, you know what? With this geopolitical setting, we cannot change it. It's only the Messiah that can change it. So let's wait for the Messiah. So actually, the peoples are divided about how to liberate this country. And Jesus comes, and what is his answer? He doesn't give a sixth answer. It's very interesting. There is no sixth answer by Jesus. What does he do? He calls a community where you have people with the background of Pharisees. They have people, zealots, yeah, in two minutes I have to finish. I mean, uh, people who were zealots, uh, people who were tax collector. All of these groups become part of a new community because all of these other answers are decide divisive. And Jesus came to make the community whole, not to give another six, devi six divisive answer. So, creating a community. And the, the sixth, so I will quickly just, the sixth is so, six point, the kingdom. Gary talked about it. Uh, in the Old Testament, they want to have a state like all others. You know, you look at these five superpowers and you, want, you say, you know, we want one too. And it's true, you know, the first question the disciples asked Jesus after the resurrection is what? Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom? As if this kingdom was ever functional. Tell me any state in this region that really functioned. I mean, the Bible tells us that it was all failure, total failure. And the, the, the disciples, after three, year, three, three years with Jesus, they don't have any other question except this. It's a disaster. And what is the answer of Jesus? Different interpretation than Gary's. You will receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and until the end of the world. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was creating a kingdom. He was telling you, you know, the vision you are thinking about is only this tiny state. Come on. Smaller than, you know, uh, uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure what's now. Uh, Dilwa, yeah? Smaller than Dilwa. I mean, is this the vision you are talking about? Let me show you the vision I'm having in mind. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Now remember, Judea and Samaria were divided. Why? Because in the Middle East, all the boundaries are set by the superpowers. Up to this moment, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, all, all were set by the superpowers. They dictate the boundaries. And Jesus was telling people, you know what? Think of this world as a land without boundaries. And you know what? You are going to all of these five superpowers and you are going to proclaim another kingdom. Much powerful than any of them. You talk about vision, this is where vision starts. And the last, and the last thing is the spirit. 
And just very quickly, in the Old Testament, it should not happen through might or power, but through my spirit. What Jesus actually came to do is to give this country a new spirit, different than what all other superpowers are trying to give us. And I feel what is at stake in this land is the spirit. What kind of spirit are we going to have in this country? What kind of spirit, what kinds of culture is going to prevail? Right now, it doesn't look very good. But it's all about this spirit. So, if you see this, and I will end here, actually understand that it was really our forefathers who wrote the Bible. It was our forefathers to whom the revelation was given. And believe it or not, the Bible, if you live as a Palestinian and read it as a Palestinian, you think it has been written just yesterday. Because it deals not with some spiritual issues up there. It deals with the real issues of this region. And it gives a very interesting answer. Unfortunately, 2,000 years later, Jerusalem doesn't know what makes for peace. Thank you. you have done. Uh, what we will have is now, uh, before we hear uh, Dr. Uh, Atik, we would have uh, a time of prayer, and then uh, Dr. Atik will come and uh, will present to us his presentation. Can you please all stand with us? Uh, and we want to pray especially for uh, Dr. Mitri Rahib and his ministry, because uh, even though Dr. Rahib didn't say this, but at the heart of his really life is praying and at the heart of his understanding is the work of the spirit, as he mentioned late, later. I want to, uh, want to have a representative from uh, the U.S., Gary Birch, if possible, and a Palestinian representative, and uh, that's uh, uh, Reverend Alex, and also uh, Brother Andrew, if possible, three of you. This is uh, the Holy Evangelical Trinity. So... <laughs> Three of you can come, please, and uh, I want you to lay hands. I know Dr. Rahib in the Lutheran tradition perhaps doesn't have that, but we'll embarrass him enough to lay hands on him and, uh, and pray, pray for him. Because it is so good, we want to pray that it will prosper and spread all over the world what he has said. spirit, says the Lord. We realize at this moment, Lord, we are totally dependent on your spirit. We always were, but we didn't know it. We didn't want to know it. Now we consciously, Lord, bow before the authority of the Holy Spirit. After having heard this stirring message of one of your servants, we identify with him. We show our, our loyalty to him and the cause of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We as a gathering here from many countries in the world, we bless this man and express our strong desire. Only one desire we have, that the world will see who Jesus is in his kingdom. That is your spirit, Lord. Therefore, we bless our dear brother in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, we do thank you for the great ministry that you have given to our brother, Mitri. 
Thank you for the spirit that you have grown inside of him since his youth. Thank you for the great courage he has shown in his ministry. We pray for the protection of this shepherd. We pray that you would protect his flock. We pray that you would protect his voice so that he will continue to speak with courage and clarity and conviction and be such a bold, bold, bold apostle for you in this place. Father, above all, we pray that you would protect his heart so that he would continue to walk closely with you, that his heart would not be filled with discouragement in a situation that is very, very strenuous. Oh, Lord, we lift him up to you and we bless him. We thank you for him. And we call upon you to protect and care for him. Yeah, Abana Samawi, Al Ab, Wal Ibn, Wal Ruh Al Qudus, Al Ilah Al Wahid. Yarab Nashkurak, Min Ajil, the Doctor Mitter Rahib, or Min Ajil, Hidmato, Fihadi Al Bilad. Allah Min Nashkurak, Min Ajil Kul, Il Amal Al Jabara, Alati Yakum Biha, Fi Medina Bait Lahem, Fi Al Mushtam Al Falustini, Waidan Tathiro, Fi Manatik, Adide, Haul Al Alam. يا رب نصلي إنك تستمر تملأ بروحك القدوس تستمر يا رب تستخدم وأينما توجه وأيضا هنا في مدينة بيت لحم بارك الكنيسة التي يرعاها بارك المؤسسات التي يشرف عليها بارك يا رب عملك في قلوب الناس الذين يحتك بهم يوما بعد يوم يا رب نشكرك من أجل كل الإنجازات التي قام بها يا رب نصلي ونطلب إنك تستمر بروحك القدوس تعمل من خلاله من خلال كنيسته من خلال كل المؤسسات لأجل مجد اسمك على هذه الأرض باسم الرب يسوع المسيح آمين We are so glad for uh, also today that we have with us one of the pillars of Palestinian theology. No doubt that Reverend Dr. Naeem Atik is a major turning point in Palestinian theology in the 20th century and beyond. The Reverend Dr. Naim Atik is the founder and head of the Sabil Ecumenical Liberation Theology. He is a former canon of St. George Cathedral in Jerusalem. He was the first to articulate a Palestinian theology of liberation in his book, Justice and Only Justice, a Palestinian theology of liberation, which is also available not only in English, but also in Arabic, gladly which explores the political, religious, biblical, and theological dimensions of the conflict in the Holy Land. His latest book, A Palestinian Christian Cry for Reconciliation, was published in 2008. We are indeed honored to have Reverend Dr. Naeem Atik with us. Please welcome him as he comes forward. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a great privilege to be with you uh, this morning. I'm very glad for this opportunity. I would like to congratulate uh, Bethlehem Bible College for this wonderful conference and for the speakers, uh, wonderful speakers that uh, have taken part in this, uh, uh, in, this, in this conference and the wonderful audience also. Uh, that's here. So I am, I am thankful for being invited to say a few words uh, at, at the end of this uh, time together. I also would like to thank uh, my friend uh, Assis Mitri uh, for uh, beginning this morning with an overview, uh, more regional, uh, more global, and I uh, the way I have read the topic, which has been 
uh, given uh, to me, I see it more about the more specific or the more, the more local. The topic that has been suggested is contextual theology as it deals with realities on the ground. So the way I, I uh, uh, looked at it, um, what I would like to do is focus on what we do on the ground uh, against the reality that is, uh, that is there. Now, in my own ministry, um, I obviously I use the word contextual, but I prefer to use the word liberation instead of contextual. Now, obviously, we begin with the context, so we deal with the context, but the context for me is only the launching pad uh, for doing theology, and the objective is the liberation of the context. That is, Christ for us is the liberator. And, and so we try to begin by looking at the context, analyzing the context, and then seeing how, how God leads us in addressing the, um, the problems, the difficulties within that context. But essentially, the objective is to find a resolution of those uh, um, of the uh, of what's happening within within the context. So, at the heart of our work is Christ, the Liberator. Christ is at the center of all of this. Um, but you know, when we when we address the context, obviously we come to the context with a certain theology. Uh, and so when we say contextual theology or liberation theology that is dealing with the realities on the ground, that presumably we are beginning with a theology that addresses that, that context. Now, what is this theology to begin with? Then what is the reality on the ground? And what we have done, uh, at least in the ministry of Sabil, to really address uh, this. So I want to say a few words about uh, theology, but very, very few. And if there are more gaps in what I say, uh, I hope some of you will ask me questions. Um, uh, because I think, especially when one is talking to evangelicals, um, one needs to try to um, use evangelical language or evangelical concepts that, uh, that they can identify with and maybe relate to so that there can be a communication uh, between, uh, between us and between them. Now, I, uh, I don't know whether I can succeed uh, because I, I would see myself as an evangelical, but it depends on how you define, obviously, everyone, how he or she would define what they mean by an evangelical. Now, um, one of the problems uh, that I really think uh, uh, that we face, uh, because with evangelicals, or certain evangelicals, the, the whole emphasis is really on the land, and they begin by saying that the land was given uh, to the uh, children of Israel by God, and so there is an emphasis on that part of the Old Testament that for me reflects really a tribal understanding of God, and I see that tribal concept uh, um, in the development of uh, religious thought within the Old Testament itself. It is, uh, um, it is uh, overcome, it is transcended by a much more universal, universal uh, concept of God. And that's very important. I think that needs to be uh, to be addressed uh, in when, whenever we talk about it. Now, one indication, which probably might not be clear to many people, is uh, is found in the at the end of chapter one of the Gospel of John, and I I have the reference in uh, in the latest book that I have, and I think 
For me, it was a revelation when I came across it in, in just reading uh, the New Testament, where you remember the story of Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder and uh, the ladder, according to the story in Genesis, was placed on the, on the land. The ladder was on the land. And the angels of God were ascending and descending. It's very interesting story. At the end of chapter 1 of John, there is almost the same story, but now Jesus is conversing with Nathaniel uh, in, in the end. And it talks about the angels of God ascending, descending and ascending, but the ladder is placed not on the land, it's placed on the Son of Man. The whole land issue is marginalized in the New Testament. The whole land issue is totally marginalized. And the center is no more the land. It is Christ. Now, in the Palestinian liberation theology, this is the center. So the land in the, within the New Testament, and I'm sure it has been discussed in this, uh, in this conference because it's part of the heart of of the whole theology that we have. The land loses its emphasis, its, its strength, its, uh, uh, its focus in, in that sense. And, uh, and so in our expression of a Palestinian theology of liberation, we really begin with Christ, we end with Christ. Christ is the key to understanding the scriptures. Christ is the key to, under, to interpreting the scriptures. Anything that does not fit with the standard of Christ is not authoritative for me, even if it is written in the Bible, because at the heart of the Bible for me is Christ. That's it. And I think in many ways that critiques some, let's say, more extremist views of some evangelical Christians. Now, more specifically, in a Palestinian theology of liberation, Although here in the Middle East, when you look at the Orthodox churches, and most of us, all of us probably, uh, Palestinians, and at one time or another, uh, wear or belong to the Orthodox church, um, uh, we were Orthodox. My, my father's family was Orthodox. And all of us came from that because it was the original church of the land. Um, and within the Orthodox churches of the land, there is a great emphasis on the divinity of Christ. You go to the churches, Orthodox churches, you go to the liturgies, and the divinity of Christ is very, very much emphasized in all aspects of the liturgy. Although we continue to emphasize the divinity of Christ, but in a Palestinian liberation theology, our emphasis is also on the humanity of Christ. So for us, Jesus was a Palestinian who lived in Palestine. And before 1948, for uh, some of you might not realize this, but before 1948, all the people living in Palestine were Palestinians. Before the establishment of the State of Israel, all the people living in the land, whether they were Christians or Muslims or Jews, they were all Palestinians and they held Palestinian passports. So it's not like Palestinian Jews uh, is a foreign concept to us. They were Palestinian Jews for 2,000 years until 1948. From the second century, beginning of the second century, until 1948, there were Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Jews. Not exactly because the Muslims came in the seventh century, but at least for Christians and Muslims, uh, Christians and Jews, there were Palestinians Christians and Palestinian Jews ever since the second, the second century. So, uh, so we emphasize the humanity of Christ. Jesus was a Palestinian who was born under occupation. Jesus lived under occupation. Everything he taught, everything he said was done under occupation, exactly the way we do today. You know, most of our people Nowadays, the younger generation has been born under occupation. 
And so everything we do, our life, our activities, our relationships are all happening under occupation. And finally, Jesus was killed by the occupation forces. Now, Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus Christ, becomes the author and finisher of our faith. And he is the center of our faith. And, uh, and we don't, therefore, we don't read the Bible in a flat way. I know some evangelicals read the Bible in a flat way. We don't. Christ is the climax. And we begin actually with the New Testament rather than the Old Testament. At least the way we teach our, our people at Sabil. It's, we don't begin with the Old Testament because we can only understand the Old Testament when we interpret it through the eyes of the New Testament and through the eyes of Christ. And so in many ways, Christ critiques many of the things in the Old Testament and critiques many of the things within maybe the, Old, the New Testament and critiques many of the things which happens within the church. So to follow Jesus today is to follow one who teaches us what it means to have sacrificial love. And you know, in the, in the New Testament, actually, at the heart of it, it's not faith that is emphasized, it is love. And Paul is very clear about this. If I have faith to, redo, to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And again, one of the critiques of some evangelical Christians is that their emphasis is on faith rather than love. And we Palestinian Christians critique that. Because we believe that in our life today, and I will say more about it in a minute, we must live Christ's love in our life. And to follow Jesus Christ means to follow the path of nonviolence. Because that's the way we understand Jesus Christ. We don't have time, but there are wonderful scholars in the West whom we have learned from and who, are, who have taught us and opened our eyes, opened our eyes as Palestinian Christians about the importance of, uh, um, of uh, the whole question of nonviolence. And so today, um, we walk the way of nonviolence because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the New Testament teaches us to resist evil. We must resist evil, whether within our own lives or whether evil within the community. But we must resist evil without using evil methods. And that's, we believe, the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, yes, we teach our people to resist the evil occupation of Israel to the Palestinian territories. This is clear, because it is evil, and it must be resisted. But we believe that we must resist it through nonviolent methods. Now, if you accept, basically, in a nutshell, what I have just said, uh, that our theology stems from Jesus Christ, and is centered in Jesus Christ, and Christ's love for people, and Christ's love for all people, and Christ's concern for the, the weak and the marginalized in society, and it is the way of nonviolence, then what we have tried to do is take this theology, translate it into actions or into programs, and that's when we establish the ministry of Sabine. So, so this is our contextual theology, or I would say liberation theology. And the question is, okay, how can we translate it and, and help our people? So at Sabil, Sabil, to begin with, is a totally ecumenical organization. I'm an Anglican priest, but Sabil is not an Anglican organization. Sabil is totally ecumenical. We serve all the people of this land. 
all the Christians and beyond the Christian community. So Sabil uh, is grassroots, uh, ecumenical, and what we've done, we've established this center and we decided from the very beginning that there are three areas that we want to emphasize because they, are, they have to do with the reality on the ground. So what is this reality? We saw that the reality of the first, reality of the ground, ground for us as Christians has to do with the Christian denominational divisions. So the first reality has to do with the Christian community. The second reality has to do with the, with the fact that we live among other religions, whether we like it or not. And the third reality has to do with the whole question of injustice, of the oppression of what's really happening on the political uh, arena. So, uh, so what we have done, therefore, is infuse infuse this theology within these three different areas that for me encompass our life in, this, in, this, in our land. You know. So, Sabil has a very strong ecumenical ministry um, uh, with the Christian community. So, we, uh, we work with women, with children, with, uh, with uh, young, young people, young adults. We work with clergy of all the different churches and we, we work in order to strengthen uh, and the, the Christian community to build up the body of Christ. So this is a very strong ministry, but we also teach them, uh, teach them about the importance of nonviolence and being involved in the community and in the life of the community. So this is a very important ministry of Sabir. And, uh, uh, and few, just about a month and a half ago, we had our third national uh, clergy conference. We had 52, uh, about 52 uh, clergy of all the churches, representing all the churches of the land, inside Israel and on the West Bank. So we had representation from all the different churches and in this conference, um, we um, uh, actually, if you look at the number of clergy in the country between Israel and the West Bank, we almost had approximately one-third of all the clergy were present in the Jericho Sabil uh, uh, clergy conference. And, and that was, we felt that was very important because in these conferences, we tried to strengthen uh, the, the ministry of the church through working with the pastors uh, of the churches. So this is the way uh, liberation theology is being translated into building up the body of Christ. Because of the time, I need to just really uh, highlight uh, these ideas without going into greater detail. Secondly, uh, the second reality on the ground has to do with the presence of the religions. Uh, the religions, uh, and mainly for us here, uh, I would say something about Judaism later or about the Jews, but what I'd like to emphasize here is the, the, the Muslim, the Islam, the religion, the religion of, the Muslim, uh, of the Muslims. And here, we, our aim as Sabil in our theology is to really create greater understanding because we believe understanding would lead us to greater respect of the other rather than in our speech. Because unfortunately, in the history of the church, uh, we blundered. We blundered. We spoke one way, and we acted in a different way. And I believe today that they must see Christ in us, otherwise uh, our words will not make any difference. And that's why... <laughs> we believe this is the only gospel that they will read. This is the gospel of our life, and this is the gospel that we use. So, we work with the Muslim community in that way. In this conference, I mentioned to you about the clergy. We dedicated one whole day for, uh, for Muslims. So, we invited 40 sheikhs, uh, and this is just the beginning. <coughs> this is just the beginning. <coughs> 
um, 40 sheikhs, including the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who came to the conference, and we had lectures given by Muslims and, and Christians, uh, and then uh, discussion groups. And on every round table, there were Muslims and, and Christian cl clergy uh, speaking and discussing. It was one of the highlights of our conference. And I, we hope that through that kind of um, relationship, we will at least witness for Christ and we can work together to address many of the problems that we have in our communities today and in our society. The third, uh, the third area about the reality on the ground is the reality of the oppression by Israel. Israel is an occupier. It has occupied Palestinian territories. We cannot go into great details, but I think many of you are familiar with what has been happening. And we believe that the occupation must end if we, if we hope to have a uh, peace. And so uh, looking at this reality, addressing this reality, um, we, we know that the reality can be expressed not only in occupation, but through injustice, oppression, deception of the Israelis, uh, racism, and some Israeli Jews themselves are talking and writing about that Israel today has become a racist state. So in, in my writings, and there is one chapter in the most recent book, it's about racism, Israeli racism, and I only quote from Jewish sources. You know, it's, if we quote from Palestinian sources, they will not believe us. But when they see that their own people are beginning to detect not only detect, is more than detection, because it is being practiced today, uh, this type of racism in there. And so, in Sabir, um, we preach justice. Justice today is at the heart of our ministry. Truth, we, have, we must have a commitment to truth in everything we do. And as I mentioned, our commitment is unflinching. It is nonviolent because this is the way of Christ. And so we must resist. And today, we have friends of Sabil in different parts of the world. I have, just, I, have, I have just come back from the United States where we had three regional conferences. And these three regional conferences make up 32 regional conferences during the last seven years that Friends of Sabil have done in the United States. And, uh, and, we, and it is within this area that we work with the Jewish people. Every conference that we have, and I invite you if you, are, if you come from the United States, we will have more regional conferences. I am sure in whatever area you might be living. Thank you. Um, um, these regional conferences are unbelievable. In every in every conference, we have Jewish speakers, we have Muslim speakers, and we have Christian speakers. And the only condition we place on speakers, they have to believe in nonviolence. We will never, we will not invite any speaker that is going to preach violence because we do not accept it, and these are Sabil conferences. And so in, in San Francisco, Marin County, uh, which was the last conference, we had, we had to close down the registrations because we had over 500 people that were ready to come to the conference. And uh, thank God, because it is in these conferences that we are helping people understand what's happening on the ground. But I tell you, my friends, we have, I, I can see that within the last seven years, this ministry has moved from just to begin with educational, that is educating people out about what's happening in the ground. We have moved from education to advocacy, and I believe now we have moved from advocacy to activism. And so the emphasis has been in the three conferences, the last three conferences, on BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. That is because we believe, because we believe that um, we must use nonviolent methods 
we think that Israel today is not listening. It's not even listening to the United States. It's closest ally. In fact, Israel, in the, in the mind of many people, it, is, it seems to be stronger than the United States itself. So it can shun the United States and does what it wants. And so our friends are saying we must begin to act for the sake of Israel, not only for the sake of the Palestinians. And that is very, very important. For the sake of peace, for the sake of justice, we must do whatever we can to really uh, put an end to Israeli oppression of the Palestinian people. So this is, um, uh, and I tell you, in the forefront of this struggle are Jewish peace activists. And I thank God, I thank God for Jewish activists. They are, they are, they have greater courage than we do in the way they speak, in the way they act. And we are grateful to God for, uh, for what's happening. And my friends, this is the challenge for all of us as evangelicals. We also need the evangelical voice to be courageous and to be lifted up against the oppression. God is a God of justice and justice is the other side of love. When we love, we don't commit injustice. And so if we are concerned about the Jewish people and we are concerned about the Palestinian people, we must work today for justice. And in the way we have worked it out for us at Sabil, we work for justice because it will lead us to peace. But neither justice nor peace are the end of the road for us. Because the end of the road for us is reconciliation. And Christ has entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. But in order to get to the reconciliation, we must work for justice. And justice will bring about peace, and peace will open the way for reconciliation. And this is, this is the ministry that God has laid on our hearts. Please pray for us and work with us so that we can achieve justice, peace, and reconciliation. Thank you very much. We will, in our seats, can you please close your eyes with us before we have the questions, we'll have a short prayer for Dr. Naeem Atik also. Father, we thank you so much for the ministry of Dr. Naeem, and we ask that you will bless him. We thank you for all the ministry that Sabil is doing, for all the good things that they are advocating, for their willingness to stand with the oppressed, for their willingness to fight oppression, for, their, for the centrality of Jesus Christ in their ministry. And Lord, we ask that you will bless them in more than one way. Give Pastor Naeem, Reverend Naeem, give him health, give him strength, and Lord, give, him, give his voice the power to go to places where his message have not been heard before. May the people here, Lord, interact with him and cooperate with him and with Sabil to spread the kingdom of God, a kingdom of peace and justice and reconciliation. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want uh, now to have a time of questions and answers and uh, would you please uh, use the microphone in the middle and um, if you have a question, please uh, say your name uh, and then state the question without comments. Please state the question without comments. If you have comments, both of them would be glad to receive your comments in writing or after the meeting is over. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Rahib. My name is Marianne. Um, I didn't understand your fifth point. 
You said the third most important question is how do we liberate ourselves? I got the points you listed, but didn't understand your conclusion. Could you just clarify that a little bit, please? Um, yeah, thank you. I hope there will be many questions like this coming because I, the time was so short and they were pushing me. So, uh, what was Jesus' point on liberation? Uh, what I said actually is that Jesus did not provide a, a sixth answer, a sixth model, because this would have been divisive. It would have divided. You know, you have five and you end up with six. But what he rather did, he had in mind liberation start by creating a community. And a community that is so inclusive that it could, you know, it has all of these people from all of these other uh, movements, but also it has the sinners, it has, I mean, everyone was there. And so this is where Jesus starts. And basically by creating the community, he's saying, you know, all these other five answers are reacting to the situation. By creating a community, you are acting, not reacting. And often I feel that in our context, we always react to what Israel does this, we react. They do this, we react. It's not about reaction. It's about creating an action. It's creating a community. I think this is, this is so important. My name is Ron, um, Reverend Atik. Could you please help me understand more clearly how you integrate Jesus' command in Matthew 5 to not resist an evil person with your understanding that the New Testament generally teaches us not or to resist evil? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I would say that most, uh, to my knowledge, almost all New Testament scholars that I am aware of. There might be others I'm not aware of. Um, would interpret that text within the New Testament, also within the, the New Testament general uh, or similar, um, similar text where what was, me what was meant, do not resist evil with evil. Although in the, New Te in the Matthew text, you are right, uh, that word is not uh, continued, but uh, you find it in, um, in the writing of Paul uh, more than once. You find it in the writing of Peter, uh, where uh, the same type of verse or the same type of statement is being made, but it is added, don't resist evil with evil. So, it, it is, so when you look at the New Testament message in, in its... Uh, in a more comprehensive way, uh, that's the meaning that scholars have given to the words of Jesus also in Matthew. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for your talks, both of you. Um, both of you used the term liberation theology. Uh, could you, oh, oh no, I heard, well we heard, could you compare and contrast uh, Palestinian liberation theology with classic liberation theology that, that arose uh, from South America and Latin America in the mid-20th century. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I use liberation theology all the time. I, I cannot talk about, um, I think other, we have in the, in the Palestinian, um, in the Palestinian society or theological uh, approach to things, we, uh, there have been three different um, uh, words that have been used. Uh, we have some theologians that have used the word local theology. Uh, others, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, C. Smithry is one of, uh, one of the ones who used contextual theology. I have always used the word liberation theology. And it is true, obviously, liberation theology is not a term that uh, I created, but it has been used uh, starting with uh, liberation theology in Latin America. Um, uh, but I have felt, for me, uh, that uh, 
um, uh, it is more helpful if I'm using the word liberation because what we are about here uh, and what we are trying to, uh, to achieve is liberation, you know, and Jesus is our liberator. Uh, and so I have taken merely uh, a title. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are copying the way things happen because in liberation, liberation theology in Latin America, it had to do with the context in, uh, in Latin America. And as you know, some liberation theology has been accused of being, of using Marxist uh, language and so on. Here, we did not have to use any other, uh, any other uh, um, uh, Marxism or any other philosophy as far as that concerned because we have the Bible. And so our theology comes out from the biblical and in this, in, the, in our, my latest book, uh, those of you who have read it, there are 14 chapters, but nine of the chapters use uh, texts from the Bible uh, and trying to, to deal with it. So it is a liberation theology that comes out from this context, you know. But uh, thank God for the Latin American liberation theologians that also drew our attention to this important aspect of theology. And as you know, once that happened there, it really spread in different uh, places in the world. So you have black liberation theology, women liberation theology, and all kinds of different liberation the theologies. So we have used a, uh, a, uh, a language or a, uh, a title or a statement or whatever that can, can be applied in our own uh, context of life. May I just add to that, uh, uh, Reverend Time is right. I mean, I like to use the word contextual, although, you know, it's not like important for salvation to call it contextual theology. But uh, I started, influ uh, you know, using it more and more because when I studied in Germany, uh, Germans, I know there are few here, so don't get offended, please. But, you know, when they were talking about theology done in Germany, they will talk about theology. That's the main thing. Contextual theology was like subtropical theologies, you know, for Latin America and South Africa and so on. When I talk about contextual theology, my point, I hope it was clear, is that this is actually the original context of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, the Bible was not written in D.C. And not in Texas, by the way, I mean. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think we really don't think about it. It was written here, and it is connected to the life, to this context. If you don't read the context, you will never actually understand the Bible. This is the old context. And so this is why, you know, people were saying the land is the fifth gospel. And what I'm saying is that the peoples of the land, their experience here is the sixth gospel. This is where we have to listen to. My name's Mark Calder. I live in Scotland. Uh, thanks both for your talks. Reverend Meacher, you said um, that reading the Bible as a Palestinian, you feel it was written yesterday and for, for you. And I think everyone here could understand that. Um, but I note from your book, Reverend Naeem, that uh, many Christians have stopped using the Old Testament um, many Palestinian Christians have stopped using the Bible entirely and, and have become quite disaffected from the church. It is almost as if the text has, they've been exiled from the text, the text is occupied. How can you translate the theology that people like yourselves and many other people here have done to kind of resist the occupation of the text and restore the text to Christians living in Gaza and living in Nablus and living in, with the daily reality of occupation? Uh, first of all, I think we need to, we need to accept the fact that uh, the Bible is abused all the time. So it's not like uh, it's a text that people can read and interpret and, uh, uh, and find it helpful. For some for Palestinian Christians, many of our people don't like the Old Testament. There are many parts in the Old Testament I don't like. Um, and I don't think they're helpful. And I tell you, I think 
You see, the problem is we have been taught that this is the word of God and we must accept it completely. Well, I, I bet if I sit down with you and read certain texts, I will ask you whether you think that's the word of God. And you can, I'd like to hear what you would say. And so, interpretation is very, very important. How do you interpret the text is very, very important. And unfortunately, in the history of the church, the Old Testament and some parts of the New Testament have been used in a, in a, in a very negative way. I mean, you cannot prove going to war from the New Testament, period. You can prove going to war from the Old Testament. And in the history of the church, that's exactly what the church has done. From the 4th century on, it's unbelievable. And so there are texts about, about the violence of God in the Old Testament that I cannot accept. The violence of God texts are unacceptable. And I need to have the courage to say, I cannot accept those texts. Because there, unfortunately, there are what I would call many Old Testament Christians. I hope I'm a New Testament Christian. And I believe there is a big difference with that. You know. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to throw the Old Testament. No. I will interpret it. And it needs to be interpreted. And most of the texts that I have chosen here are Old Testament texts. Which means I still value the Old Testament, but we have to be very, very careful with the Old Testament, because most of the problems we are facing today from Christian Zionists and from Jewish Zionists comes out because of, the, of their understanding of the Old Testament. And that is totally rejected. And I, I really challenge, this is a challenge for all of us, and challenge mainly to, to evangelicals, because I believe that uh, 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 the Bible is, is very precious for Protestants, I hope for all Christians, but I think we need to be very, very careful and how we interpret, how we interpret the scriptures, uh, especially in light of the abuse, misuse uh, of, the, of, the, of the Bible. And I think this is obviously a big topic and it needs to be uh, uh, fleshed out in so many different ways. And I would hope that some of these things, I'm sure, have been lifted up during this conference as well. Uh, can I add maybe just... Uh, actually, uh, actually um, you know, I teach uh, Bible for Christian and Muslim students, for example, in our guiding course. And uh, for me, it's actually important if, if you really take what I said serious, what I'm saying actually is that those people who wrote the Bible were our forefathers. And they are the forefathers of people living in, in Nablus. I think the biggest problem that happened actually is that our, it's not that our land was confiscated, you know? People think that's the, it's not. Do you know what is really the most difficult thing? Is that Rome, confiscated our story and gave it a biblical name. Romes come to us under a biblical name so that occupation becomes connected to the Bible, which is not originally. And so, on the contrary, for me, I say, the Old Testament is my book fully the book of my forefathers, and including the violent passages. Do you know why? <coughs> because still in our community we have violent people. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. There are so many people misusing the name of God for violence. Including, by the way, don't think only of Hamas and Jihad and the settlers. You know, I think all of these settler, you know, evangelicals who bring these checks to Israel, you know, for them to buy weapons so that the second coming will come earlier than before. All the time, people are using, unfortunately, the name of God 
for violence. And, you know, some of my students say we should take these passages out. No, we should not. Do you know why? Because then we will be beautifying the picture of religion. I think these stories are important because they are a call to repentance. They are a call for us to repentance that some of our people, and again, I, I don't take just the good stories in the Bible to say these are my forefathers. Even Joshua was my forefathers because we still have some people who think so exclusively. If you don't have in your people, I have among my people. So he belongs there because God wants to tell him that faith is something different than religion. And this is why I don't compete with religion. It's and liberation, it's about faith. It's not about religion. I want to thank I want to thank both of you for being with us today, and I wish uh, we have given more time. Uh, you, you both deserve much more time than we have uh, given to you. I want to ask you really a very practical question, and I want you to give an answer not only to us here, but also to the Israeli authorities who are following this um, conference religiously. <laughs> All right? Uh, just a few days before the conference started, two of us from Bethlehem Bible College were called to the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And they start asking us many questions. Why the title, Christ at the Checkpoint? Couldn't find a better title. Why is this? Why is that? And they gave us a lot of whys. And they were interrogating uh, some of us. And... Um, then, one of our presenters, Tony Campolo, you don't mind me saying this, thank you. He was asked to uh, appear before Israeli authorities yesterday and before yesterday. yesterday. And they were also asking him uh, questions. Why is this and why is that and, and why do you participate in this conference and so on. But for us and also for uh, Dr. Tony Campolo, there was also a question. Why would you have Dr. Naeem Atik and why would you have Dr. Mitchell Rahib in your conference? What would you like to say to the Israelis about why are you here? I am here because you invited me. <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, if I were not invited by the Bible College, I would not be here. Um, <clears throat> but I think we need today, this is again part of the witness that we have. I think we need to have the courage to really speak truth to power. And I believe that the Israelis uh, the Israeli leadership have become used uh, have become used uh, to um, um, to whenever they whenever they um, invite religious people or others and they begin to confront them Israelis are used now that other people will cow down before them Religious leaders, archbishops, bishops, uh, moderators of churches, everyone is afraid. And Israeli, uh, pro-Israeli, pro-Israeli um, uh, Jews, the, the lobby in, the, in, in Washington, APAC, and others, they know that people are weak. And they are strong, and they will confront you, and they will say you are anti-Semitic, and you immediately are frightened and you want to say, no, I don't want to, I'm not anti-Semitic and so on. And that will silence you. And the Israeli, the pro-Israel lobby has silenced many, many people. And so it is very psychological also. When, you, when they call you, you know, they know 
that their aim is to silence you. And it will make you think next time, unless you have so much courage within you and your conviction is so strong that you are willing to take a stand. And I tell you very frankly, I mean, I'm talking from a Sabil perspective. I have given up on bishops and archbishops. I have spoken to so many of them and just asked them to say the truth and the church leadership uh, is not willing to really do that. And we see not only in terms of religious leadership, we only see it, we also see it among political leadership and that's why nowadays we are emphasizing the importance of the grassroots, of civil society, of church people, the, 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 the file and rank of people who are willing to have the courage to really stand up and look these Israeli, uh, Israeli leaders in the eye and say, look, because you are doing injustice. That's why we have a conference here. And that's why we need to speak. My friends, this is the only way, the only way. And we should never be silenced. If we are really have a commitment to Christ and to the truth that is in Christ and to justice and the God of justice, we should never allow them to intimidate us. And that's exactly what they want them to do. And that's why they called uh, Tony and, and the leadership of the Bethlehem College because they really know that they can intimidate you and you will be silenced. And I pray to God that we will not be silenced and we will look them in the eye and say, you are doing an injustice and we have, we have a responsibility to face you with the injustice. We are not against you. We are not anti-Semitic. We actually want you to live securely, but you have to do justice for the Palestinians. That is the message that I think we need to boldly give it to the Israelis. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I thank you for the question, uh, Assis. Uh, maybe just, uh, I would say three things. Just a name, uh, one, one moment. We will not have more questions apart from the two standing. Uh, so, so for those, you know, like please, uh, if you have questions, you can ask after they finish because for the sake of time. So the, the two will be the last two questions and please say your name, your full name, as well as the name of the organization and then your question after Reverend Mitri finishes commenting. Uh, I mean, what I would tell our friends who are watching, uh, you, you know, our big, big brother who is watching, um, that first of all, that the Palestinian Jew Jesus has liberated us and so there is no power on earth that can make us slaves again. And the second thing is uh, look at the context I was describing, understand it really fully, you will realize that none of the superpowers was able to prevail in Palestine. Do you know why, and here again to Gary, do you know why Jesus said, blessed are the meek? Because there isn't one superpower that was able to occupy the land fully. They all leave because this is occupiers leave. This is why they are called occupier. Who stays in the land? Not those with money, the meek, the poor, they stay in the land. Everyone else leaves. And so Jesus was exactly, you know, he saw the big picture, you know. He exactly knew what's going on in this country. And the third point is, listen to what the Palestinian Jew has been saying because you can learn from him a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jim Schutz. I work at the International Christian Embassy. And uh, first I want to thank both of you for your presentations. I found, them, I found it really helpful for me in understanding more about the situation. 
and about my Palestinian brothers and sisters. Uh, my question is directed primarily to Dr. Atik, but I'd be happy to hear from both of you. I think that uh, one of the deepest frustrations in his, amongst Israelis, including on the peace camp, some of whom are close friends of mine, is the uh, perception, and justifiable to certainly some extent perception, that a significant and influential uh, segment of Palestinian society, particularly Islamic, um, really still wants the destruction of Israel. So my question is, how do you, how would you comment on that? How do you see that? And how do you see yourself affecting that? Thank you. Can you have the second question after that, and then they will answer both questions. Please go ahead and ask the question. Thank you. I'm Judith Woodall from Halesoyne Baptist Church, England. And I'd like to, when I came through customs on the Israeli side, uh, they were all asking, where are you going? So I just said, I was going to a conference in Bethlehem, and their faces dropped. And they started asking questions. I could feel they were a bit suspicious. I wonder what you, you say we ought to stick up to them. Should we say the same thing going back, rather than say we're just coming on holiday? <laughs> End of laughter. Yeah, um, on the first question, um, I am sure um, if you look at um, the Arab world, uh, like any other country in the world or region in the world, you find people uh, from different backgrounds and with different political uh, views. So it is possible that you will find people who wish the destruction of the State of Israel. Um, but I don't really believe that one can generalize. The problem with the State of Israel, or the government of Israel, is that it is convinced that everyone wants to destroy it, that, uh, that people want to destroy uh, the government, uh, the, the state of Israel. And they've used it. From my perspective, it reflects more insecurity within Israel than, uh, than not. And the problem that I see is that the Jewish people came as very insecure people to Palestine. When you really look at the two peoples, I believe in spite of our weakness as Palestinians, uh, there's still more security within us as indigenous people of the land than most of the Jews or the Israeli leaders that continue to hammer about the importance of security. I mean, if you listen carefully to the news or to the, what ha the TV channels, um, Israel would like to hear all the time the United States say, that we protect, we will protect the security of Israel. I mean, that is the chorus that every speaker within in the United States Congress or anywhere in the world have to repeat continuously whenever they mention about Israel. This is the chorus. I am committed to the security of Israel, which really reflects when you know how strong Israel is militarily, it doesn't make any sense. None of the Arab countries can destroy Israel. Take it from me, and I'm not a politician. Look at the facts. Look at the facts. Open the internet today, it's not like something surprising. I don't know more than you do. Open, just check about the military power of Israel. Israel is so powerful. 
It is what? The fourth strongest military in the world? Fourth, fifth? It is, it, it is the third or, or second, sometimes I hear, the one that is selling arms to people in the world? It's unbelievable. With, a, with a nuclear powers? But we are pigeons, you know, we are parrots because we keep repeating the same, you know, uh, security of Israel. So what I'm saying, the Palestinians since 1988 told the Israeli government, we are willing to make peace with you. Look, I don't believe everything the Palestinians or the Arabs say, but in this case, I know for a fact that our people we're sick and tired of wars, and we have compromised so much. We're willing to accept Israel on 87% of Palestine and take only 22%, and Israel doesn't want to do that. 78. 78% of Palestine, we're willing to let Israel live on 78 when Israel has no right for all of that. I'm talking politically, I'm talking international law, because that's the heart of the matter, 78% and only 22%, and Israel doesn't want to do that. So, my friends, um, I, I think most Arabs, most Arab countries, from what we know, are willing to make peace with Israel. And the 2002 offer of the, of the Arab world, it was a very generous offer, that they're willing to make peace with Israel and will meet all the demands of international law so that Israel will be secure. But you see, most of us do not want to believe this. And that's the tragedy. It is our tragedy. And the tragedy of Israel that wants to perpetuate the conflict and, and many people in the world believe it. My friends, believe me, there is a great desire for peace today and peace that Israel will live securely. And I tell you one thing more. If I know that people, Arabs or non-Arabs, want to destroy Israel, I will be one of those who will be against that because it is against my faith. It is against international law. It is against what we believe. And I think this message, my friend, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the embassy, the, what do you call it, uh, the Jew Christian embassy, it's a message that you really need to understand. You need to take it because we have many problems with the embassy because of it is blind stance against the Palestinians and Islam. You don't know, unfortunately, and you are also repeating you know, uh, these myths that we need to wake up and, and, and know that there are genuine people, whether Jews or Christians or Muslims, that are genuinely seeking a just peace for all the people of the land. And I hope this message will be very, very clear to you. And I hope that the embassy will begin to, uh, to, to change. Uh, to our sister, uh, since uh, yeah. Reverend Naim took the first, uh, the first question, I will take the second. Uh, uh, it's actually to you and to Tony. Actually, blessed are both of you. Why? Because what you experienced at the airport and what Tony experienced yesterday and the day before is something very biblical. Again, you see how relevant actually the Bible is. You remember these three magi who came from the east? <laughs> they came, they were on the way to Bethlehem and they were stopped to be interrogated by Herod. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's revelation happening in front of our eyes, right? You see, you have to, to come to Palestine to experience this. And, and 
unfortunately, unfortunately, I cannot tell you what the angel told the three magi that they should take another route because all routes, uh, all routes are still controlled by Israel. And this is why we need a Palestinian route so that in the future you don't need to undergo these uh, awful situations. So. This is time for our coffee break, and we meet again in 20 to 25 minutes. See you in 20 to 25 minutes.